Before starting our final panel discussion, I'd like to introduce to you to our moderator, Professor Rayner Pacheco Pardo. Dr. Pardo is a senior lecturer at International Relations at King's College, London, and the co-director of the London Asia Pacific Center for Social Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pardo and our four speakers on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to, to all of you for, for staying or for coming uh, to this panel. Uh, it is good to be uh, back at LSE. I did my, my PhD here, and then I moved up and I went to King's, so it's good <laughs> to be back here down at LSE. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now I'm going to briefly introduce the, the four speakers. Each of them then is going to, to talk for some five minutes, and then we're going to have uh, a couple of questions and then a Q&A with, uh, with all of you. So uh, first of all, we have uh, uh, Professor Pak, obviously, who already gave uh, one of the uh, keynote addresses uh, this morning, uh, currently professor at the GSIS uh, at Seoul National University, uh, as you all know, top-ranked uh, Korean university, uh, currently ambassador at large for international economy and trade from December 2011 to March 2013, served as minister for trade uh, for the Korean government, and he has also served as chairman of the Korea uh, International Trade Commission. Then we have uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre Lehmann, uh, Professor Emeritus of International Political Economy at uh, the MID Business School, visiting professor at Hong Kong University and NIIT University in India, and founding director of the uh, very well-known Evian Group, which is a group of experts uh, from the corporate sector, government, etc., etc., working on uh, global prosperity. And he works on globalization, global governance, trade, and development. Then we have uh, Professor Hosukli uh, Makiyama, uh, another uh, LSE alumni, currently director of SIPE, uh, one of the uh, probably most relevant think tanks working on trade and political economy uh, in Brussels. He's also a fellow uh, here at the LSE, International Relations Department. He also served as senior advisor in the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he's a leading author on trade diplomacy and uh, the digital economy. And last but not least, uh, John Hillary, currently executive director of uh, War on Want, a very well-known uh, uh, NGO organization here in, 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 in the UK. He worked in the global justice movement for the past 25 years. Uh, he brought a very widely um, distributed report on the TTIP, translated into 12 different languages, and he's also co-editor of a collection of essays under the title Free Trade and Transnational Labor. So without any further ado, I'll leave it to uh, Professor Pak. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon again. I spoke too much in the morning, so... Uh, I'll be brief, but I was given five minutes. Since I'm an economist by training, and I'm still teaching international trade, so just, I, I want to just share with you one subject, which is the, uh, the impact of trade liberalization. If you open your market, what, what kind of impact ordinarily uh, each country has? Uh, trade economist says trade liberalization is always good. That means uh, uh, market liberalization make uh, more benefits than uh, cost. So uh, you will get some benefits, but uh, you also have some uh, difficulties or burdens. But if you combine them together, the gains are bigger than losses. That's why we prefer to have market liberalization. But if you want to argue this kind of uh, uh, you know, the argument, then uh, we have to assume some role of government because there are losers out of market liberalization. Then they are not happy about that. But gainers, uh, maybe exporters and, uh, and or, or even consumers, they are very happy, but uh, we have a losers in the society. The how we can uh, uh, persuade or we can accommodate uh, those kind of losers. So that's why we have to have a government role of income redistribution. You have to collect some taxes and have some compensation to the losers. And then losers become not unhappy Then maybe we can have a FTA or multilateral trade uh, liberalization. 
But the thing is, uh, when you go to any kind of country, including Korea, when you do market opening through multilateral or regional, we have a very uh, huge demonstration against market liberalization, no matter what. Uh, especially, we have a very serious uh, demonstration against Korea US FTA. After that, we have a Korea EU FTA, not much demonstration, so EU negotiators are not very happy because why not? You are not uh, demonstrating against Korea EU FTA while you are doing it uh, very severely against uh, Korea EU, uh, Korea US FTA. But in any case, if I appear on TV and have a debate, I say, you know, trade liberalization is good because of more efficient resource allocation, consumers' benefits, gains are bigger than uh, uh, losers, maybe you can have more investment from outside. But losers come to the TV debate. My farmers, you know, uh, I'm working on the farm, especially beef farm, beef growers. My friend uh, made suicide because of Korea US FTA. My friend uh, cannot send their kids to the university because of the collapse of their farming. If you hear this as a general audience, who do you want to support? The latter. I always lose the debate uh, uh, over trade liberalization, efficiency, you know, welfare, you know, benefits. It doesn't really persuade or give impression to a uh, uh, general public. This is really a very important aspect. The gains is huge. But if you divide these gains by number of whole people, in the case of Korea, the gains divide by 50 million, each person feels very small. Some, some people may not feel the benefits. But if you add them together, it becomes a huge benefit. But losers, you know, losses are not that big, but they divide by small number of uh, people in the industries. Each people can feel huge losses. So inherently, the impact on trade liberalization on different people is excessively asymmetric. In other words, gains per person and losses <coughs> per losers is quite asymmetric. That's why losers are always can make a collective action. Collective action means demonstration against this kind of policies. They make more loud voices. The reason is they want to get more compensation. Gainers, I, I, I tell my students, why don't you come up in, the, you know, in front of City Hall? We want to make a demonstration for, for Korea US FTA. Nobody showed up. Uh, <laughs> I, I, have, you know, I don't want to spend my time. I don't have money. But uh, the losers, when they say we want to get together at certain you know, uh, time and in certain places, all the people come with their babies and everybody make a huge voices uh, against uh, uh, trade globalization. So fact of the matter is they make as much loud voices as, as possible because they want to get the more compensation. So what government should do? We have a history of 20 years of trade liberalization, meaning we have been assisting the farmers for the last 20 years. Some policies you know, failed, some policies you know, were successful. You, government should be more smart so that uh, you should you know, treat them in you know, the right policies, showing the results of the past, you know, the wrong policies. So this is the way the government should do. Uh, not much uh, winning through a uh, public debates because of the asymmetric uh, uh, situation between losers and gain. I will stop here. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, Professor Lemon. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, first, I want to say to the organizers of this meeting, congratulations. I think it's absolutely fantastic to take this initiative, manage to create this uh, room and discussion and so on and so forth. It's well done. I'm very happy to have been invited, very honored. I'm gonna make a few points quickly. Um, ROK, Republic of Korea. Uh, I went there for the first time in 1967. So not in the 1950s, <laughs> uh, but in 1967 it I was- I was four years old. I was, uh, <laughs> 1967, I was 22. I mean, 67 or 67? 67. Then I was uh, 15 years old. <laughs> Can you add the minutes? Because <laughs> so I, 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 I've been able to keep an association with Korea over the decades, and 
it's I'm again extremely honored to have had the opportunity of seeing Korea in 67 and continue the association over time. It's a fantastic success story. It's a unique success story, economically, politically, socially, culturally, environmentally. I was saying the last time I was in Korea, I was really happy to see that there were fish in the Han River again, that the air is clean and so on and so forth. But I think from some of the comments that have been made, there's also a big challenge to Korea, what next? And I think the model has been perfect, but for the younger generation, there's looking at something beyond GDPism, uh, beyond what, what, what will be the, the priorities of young Koreans. And I think this is something that those of you who are here uh, have a re re responsibility. So beyond GDPism. Second, I wanted to say something about trade, uh, because I was told that one of the questions was, what are the trade currents in free trade? And I felt like answering, what free trade? Uh, I, I'm very concerned, extremely alarmed, about the TED trends currently. Uh, I remember when I created this Avion group back in 1995, I would have speakers coming in and say things like, of course, globalization is irreversible. And I kept saying, don't say that. Of course it's reversible. It's been reversed over and over again, and it's being reversed now. So I think well, the reality is that we have to look at is we're in a world of environment which is not experiencing the centripetal forces, but centrifugal. There's fragmentation. The failure of the WTO, and I use the word failure of the WTO, not just the failure of the dollar around, is a tremendous indictment of global economic governance. And I think a lot of the things that are taking place at the FTA level are exacerbating the situation. And uh, so I'm, I'm very, very, very concerned about this. I think we have to be conscious of my own things. One of the things which I, the only criticism I would make about the session today is that we talked about cross-border movement of goods, of services, of capital, etc. We didn't talk about people. I mean, you know, th th there's tremendous demographic changes that are in the process of taking, taking place. Uh, I was speaking to a Nigerian friend over break. About 300 million people will be the population of Nigeria soon. Two billion in, in, in Africa. What about trade, jobs, and so on and so forth? And especially when you look at a lot of these FTAs, they're among the rich. They're excluding, you know. So I look at TPP. It's okay for Vietnam. Vietnam's not a rich country, but it's doing reasonably well. I go to Bangladesh a lot. It's terrible. It's unfair. And this is something which I think is very difficult to, to, to accept. So one of the concerns that I have is that the, 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 the sit way that we're looking at now is extremely myopic. We have huge population dividends, youth dividends in Africa and South Asia. We have to be concerned about what are we going to motivate, employ, ed educate, and so on and so forth. And I think trade policy has become the privilege. It's gone back to what it was. It's become the sort of privilege of the rich uh, countries and it's not sufficiently. So the fact that the Doha development agenda has failed is an indictment in so such because it should have been concentrated on development. FTAs are fine under certain circumstances. I think Europe, it would not be where it is uh, if it had not been for uh, the trade arrangements that were made in post-war Europe that I was able to live through and benefit from. Our prosperity came a lot from the fact that we had a common market. Uh, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. It also helped imme immensely to reduce uh, political tensions. I'm very, very much, I've been working a number of years on something called the Avion Group Arab region if the Arabs could have more trade and concentrate more on trade, learn a lot from uh, the ASEAN countries, uh, this might help rather than focusing on theological um, issues. Uh, I think Korea, Japan, China, FTA would be a good idea because I think it's clear that there's a tremendous geopolitical tensions out there. So I'm not sort of viscerally against the FTAs, but I am against the FTAs when they act in a dis exclusionary and discriminatory manner. I hate TPP, and I hope Korea will never join. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's, it's fundamentally wrong, it's, it's appalling. And one of the things that I, as a, a Western European, I have to say I'm always embarrassed when Western Europeans talk about our values. What do you mean our values? <laughs> you know, and particularly, for example, vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to quote somebody called Admiral Yamamoto, and I'm conscious I'm in the Korean room, I shouldn't be quoting Japanese. And Admiral Yamamoto was the head of an SOB. He planned the attack on Pearl Harbor, etc. But he had a very good phrase. He was a womanizer. He was a, a, a gambler. 
And when the Japanese invaded Manchuria, I'm not saying that they are not justifying this, but when they invaded Manchuria, the League of Nations and Britain and France and all this guy, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, while Britain was still in India and most of Africa, France was in China, the United States and the Philippines. And Yamamoto said, the Western powers taught us how to play poker. Now that they have all the chips, they've taken up contract bridge. <laughs> And that is what I feel very often. So one of the things, one of the reasons that immediately when Obama, for whom I have a certain amount of affection, I must, but when he said we have to have TPP because that way we write the rules, not the Chinese. That's not the 21st century. What about writing the rules together? What about learning the lessons and engaging with China rather than uh, doing this uh, very, very offensive manner? So I think... Um, I've only got still one minute. No, 20 minutes. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll finish. I, I think one of the things that, again, perhaps the Korean uh, forum might consider is to um, what's the role of Korea beyond the FTA with the EU, with the US? I think Korea has a, a leadership role that could be played in thinking in terms of alternatives so that trade doesn't become sort of the aided, uh, uh, demonstrated against, but that really we can s convey the sense that it is about fairness, about, uh, about justice, and about uh, concern for those who are the w losers as opposed to the winners. So these are the comments that I thought I would make uh, of a rather unprovocative nature. Thank you. So let's start by saying that General Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto committed suicide in 1944. And uh, <laughs> on, on that cheerful note, uh, I would like to first of all uh, congratulate the organiz uh, organizers, but also apologize because I think at least three of my colleagues have spoken before me. We we're actually joking behind scenes here that, well, it's like the Beatles, you know, you already had Paul McCartney and John Lennon speaking before me. I'm, I'm sure that I am, if not Ringo, I'm probably Yoko Ono, <laughs> <laughs> my organization, so. Uh, but I think the necessity of TAs, I mean, it, it is a, it sounds almost like a cliche, but uh, it is in an, in a post-WTO world, talking about suicide 2008, I saw uh, probably 100 Geneva ambassadors contemplating suicide as well before because we've spent probably, well, we've spent eight years of our careers uh, down the drain. Um, but I think we are in a situation where the FTAs have become something of, or at least in the public narrative uh, in economic policy as a necessity. And, but I would like to claim that in the context of Korea, which was, of, of course, the, the, the first Korean FTAs was hugely important for both the U.S. and EU trade policy, uh, I'd like to turn the table around a little bit bef before we talk about TTIP and TPP and everything else, that the situation for Korea was vastly, vastly different. And in terms of Korea, I think it was really not a choice, but um, let's say a lack of other choices. Uh, it was, if you think about Korea's economy at that stage, uh, more than 80% of the GDP came from trade. And, um, and still it had no FTAs. And basically if you have the Doha round falling apart, basically you, you, you are stuck. And also, it was in a stuck in an industrial model, I think, that a lot of people don't think about, but it was at the very end of an export-led growth model that was not going to last for very long. And of course, you had the two major neighbors, Japan and China. One can now compete you on a low production cost. The other one can now compete in R&D. It's not a very enviable position to be in. Trade policy, like every form of politics, is not necessarily about ideal and utopia. It's actually you can only play the cards that you are dealt. And that's something that a lot of people forget. And w another thing when it comes to Korea, which is hugely unique, which a lot of Europeans forget about, is the security situation. Uh, in the beginning of 2000, uh, the, um, the export ra um, rate of Korea hadn't only reached alarming heights, but also in terms of dependency of China. 
if I would summarize China's trade policy, it's basically chunking out mid to high priced consumer goods using Japanese components to the rising Chinese middle class. That's how you can explain a lot of the, um, the success of the chair board. And this is, of course, from a Korean Peninsula perspective, it's not necessarily an ideal situation to be in, not because of the competitiveness factor that we talked about, but also from the perspective of do you want to rely on a one-fourth of the economy to actually on which side of the bed the trade minister of China wakes up on. If he's on a bad mood, he can actually shut down a quarter of the Korean economy over a day. And, of course, um, there's a number of factors, I think, that also Europeans very often forget about in the geopolitical context and uh, Americans scaling down on the presence in the Korean Peninsula also at the same time scaling down in Okinawa, which means that if there was going to be a war in, on the peninsula, the help would have to come from Guam. And in that sense, reorientating, not ori reorienting perhaps, but diversifying from China towards all the other countries, including the EU, it has a huge strategic imperative. So I think we have to be a little bit more understanding about the, the, the bigger political context of these FTAs. It's not only about economy and trade. And, but overall, I would say, I mean, from, from the perspective of Korea, not so much from the EU, the EU, Korea, and chorus have performed quite well um, in terms of it hasn't increased export necessarily to Europe, but it's not Korea's fault. It's basically the dynamic growth we have in Europe at the moment. And it has certainly diversified away from China. And considering the fragile growth we see now on the Chinese domestic growth, I think it's, uh, it, was been, uh, it was a rather sensible choice. But most of all, it gave China, uh, sorry, Korea a certain amount of room to breathe. It could stand outside of TPP and say, okay, let's wait what the final result is. With Japan, Australia, and United States, and Canada in the room, what kind of influence would Korea play? Would it be better to actually stand outside and, and wait until what the results are and actually build your opinion based on what the actual negotiation result? Uh, so, and also by concluding a bilateral free trade agreement with U Europe and United States, it could actually re-engage with China on a completely different page, including the direct bilateral FTA, uh, which basically shut down Japan out of the CJK agreement. There are a lot of things there. And finally, um, I would say, uh, when it comes to the incomes and the winners and losers, trade agreements are basically like any form of income increase. It's like finding oil or any kind of abusing some kind of natural resource that you have on your territory. It all depends on what kind of economic distribution you have. Uh, I do have a slight ab accent. It's because I'm Swedish. And uh, in Sweden, we have a saying that you actually have to make a buck before you can redistribute it. So it, it's, very, <laughs> it's, it's very simple. Uh, if you have free trade agreements, it simply enforces every form of income redistribution system you already have. If you have a failing income redistribution and equitable society in your home country, the free trade agreement could be very harmful to you and enforce those effects. But if you have a working system that we, I would like to argue that we used to have in Sweden, then actually any form of income, uh, income effect will tickle down to all levels of the society. And the final point I think is that uh, if you look, we've heard about creative industry, for example, today, Korea's industrial model and the creativity and innovation needs to, uh, it needs a new input, it needs a new rethinking, and that's where probably the free trade agreement has not yet delivered. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramon. I'm, I'm also really um, grateful for the invitation to be here, and I think it's a fantastic event, and I, I really um, commend the organizers as well. Um, I've just actually come back from Vienna late last night in another of the pan-European meetings 
of massive groups of civil society, academics, environmentalists, trade unions, desperate to stop this new generation of free trade agreements going any further. So if maybe all of the other three members of the Beatles have already spoken. I am George Harrison, for those of you who are trying to remember who the fourth Beatle was. <laughs> and the one with perhaps a different understanding of harmonics um, and rhythm and other melodic interpretations. I loved hearing Professor Buck's um, account of, of, of how it was to be in government and always to lose the argument. Um, I think from our perspective, the problem is our governments cannot win a single argument and yet they still have the power to force through these free trade agreements time and time again. And this is our great problem as a movement. We know we are right, but we are sometimes powerless to make those arguments heard. And I think for me it is not really about the, the aggregate gains to be made from trade. I think in, in far too many senses we have treated free trade agreements through the lens of international relations. International relations which do speak to the geopolitics of trade, which are very important. I mean, we know that TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is explicitly a mechanism against China, against Brazil, 100% a mechanism against Russia. The US call TTIP the economic NATO. They want to try to isolate Russia, to break dependence on Russian oil and gas. But when you're looking at the impacts of trade, you need to look at it through the lens of political economy. International relations is not what it's about. International relations is a good way of understanding the World Cup in football because Peru will play against Germany and Germany always wins, but Brazil <laughs> will play against uh, England and Brazil always wins. And you have these unified countries playing one against the other. Political economy says no. It's not just about the winners and losers. It's about asking who benefits. And here I think I do disagree with you, Hossuk. Free trade agreements are not just a mirror which, or even a means of exacerbating the current redistribution problems. Free trade agreements are not about trade. Free trade agreements are about power. They're about the redistribution of power from labor to capital. Because free means the freedom of the big transnational companies to be able to operate increasingly without reference to the social and the environmental embedding, to use the Polanyi-esque terms, that they should have to take account of. And this is what we're now seeing in the new generation of European free trade agreements, which started with EU Korea and is now reaching its ghastly, its terrible conclusion in the TTIP agreement and the EU-Canada agreement and all of the other agreements that they're trying to bring forward. And I think for us that's really the key, that these free trade agreements are not about trade, they're about concentration of markets, concentration of power, they are about the privileging of transnational capital over domestic firms, that are privileging of big business over small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's why across Europe it's very interesting that we have thousands and thousands of small businesses now signing on to the petitions against TTIP. Thousands in Austria, in Germany, in the UK, in the Netherlands saying, we are businesses and we realize that these big FTAs are really for, f for the big transnational firms and not for us. Now, the EU career deal has been completed, but the new EU Korea deal is coming your way very soon because the European Commission has now said that they want to see the unfinished chapter of the EU Korea FTA starting now. And that is the chapter on investment protection. And this is the last thing I want to say in terms of our introductions today. The investment protection element of these FTAs is the clearest example of, the, of them being a transfer of power from society to capital. The investor state dispute settlement mechanism raises capital to the same level as the nation state. It gives transnational capital a unique privilege of being able to sue 
the host state for any law or regulation or standard introduced in the future which could impact on their profits. And you know the examples, I don't need to tell you. Vattenfall, the Swedish company, suing the people of Germany for five billion euros because the people of Germany decided they want to move away from nuclear power towards renewable energy. Why on earth should the people of Germany have to pay five billion euros to a private company for the privilege of exercising their own democratic sovereign rights? And I'm really happy we're having this debate in the London School of Economics because at the beginning of the TTIP negotiations, the UK government commissioned the LSE to do a cost-benefit analysis of introducing ISDS. I don't know if any of the authors were in this room. The cost-benefit analysis of introducing these new powers of ISDS into the EU-US relationship. And the LSE Commission report said very clearly, benefits, zero. Because there has never been an increase in investment between the USA and another industrialized country as the result of introducing these investment protection laws. Zero. Benefits, zero. This is what you're being asked in Korea, whether or not you want to have this. Costs, enormous. Because what you're allowing is the most powerful transnational corporations from the US, or in this case from the EU, you're allowing them a privileged access to a court system where they can take these actions against you. And we were told, this is, we have already told him, we will speak forever. I'm so far away <laughs> from the moderator, he can't get to me. <laughs> no, no, I'll be good. We were told here in the UK, look to the experience of Canada. Canada signed up to NAFTA 20 years ago, and it's been hit by wave after wave of these privileged lawsuits by the US. And it's meant that it has to drop environmental legislation. Its ban on fracking under the St. Lawrence River is now being challenged as a breach of free trade obligations under NAFTA. This is what we are going to expect here in TTIP which is why the whole of Europe is up against TTIP and why we will defeat TTIP, it's clear. But for people in Korea, when I was young, when I was at school, the government in this country had a big anti-drugs campaign for school children. They said to you, drugs are harmful, they'll get you addicted, you'll never be able to work, you'll never have any money, just say no. So my message to the people of Korea, when the European Union comes to you and says, we have unfinished business in the EU-Korea FTA, we want an investment chapter, just say no. Uh, we, we do have 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Uh, we have to leave the room, I think, by 5.15, because there is another event at 6, I was told. Less interesting event, but we have to leave anyway. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go straight to, to the audience. So any questions, any questions that you have? 20 minutes. 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Oh, perfect. So any questions? Uh, yes, uh, right hand side there. And then here on the front as well, we can collect the first two questions. And then on the left as well, so we can collect the first two questions. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Jackie Yin, studying finance and economy here. Um, I wanted to ask uh, several questions, but since we only have 50 minutes, I'll just ask one question. Um, uh, so, like, the China is the biggest Im export and import com country for Korea, right? Um, what do you think, like, how Korea could hedge its risk ad against the downfall of Chinese market because like I invested in Korean stock market not in Chinese but um, last year it was horrible <laughs> because of China's downfall um, is do you think there is a way for Korea to hedge its risk like against the Chinese downfall in terms of trading Hello. Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Robert Eagleton. I'm from the University of Birmingham. Um, I just wanted to respond to Professor Bach, who said, I think in your introduction, you said that trade liberalization is always good, which uh, 
I, I don't know. I think I, personally, I think I would contend that. Like, I think, of course, free trade does lead to specialization and a division of labor, which, which can be a good thing. But I think if you introduce it too early in developing economies that don't, I think if you expose, uh, yeah, developing economies like their firms and industries to the harsh realities of international trade too, too early on, then they simply can't compete and they, you know, they, they go bust. And I think also by introducing specialization at too early a stage, uh, that it can lead to uh, a low level of economic diversification. And I think I was reading somewhere that 46 of the least developed countries in the world, 50% of their trade is reliant on the export of primary products. And the problem with that is that it makes them incre incredibly precarious and volatile. And so I think sometimes maybe you do need protectionist policies. And indeed, that's how the West built up its economies. I mean, historically, there's been the Navigation Act, the Corn Laws in Britain, which have helped Britain use incredibly protectionist policies to build up its economies, its industries. And even today, the European Union has the Common Agricultural Policy, which is incredibly protectionist. And African and Latin American agricultural producers really have problems with access in the European market. So I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm convinced that trade liberalization is always a good thing in uh, um, developing countries. And we have a third one then. Thanks for your time. And uh, you know, Korea is evaluated as a country who... Yourself, I'm Lawrence Huang from University of Birmingham as well. And you know, Korea is evaluated as a country who overcame the middle income trap, right? Um, would you agree with that? And also, um, what sort of things Korea could prepare or take an action in order to catch up um, advanced economies like UK or Germany in terms of GDP per capita? Thanks. So, uh, okay. Uh, the first question, how you want to hedge against the risk of China? Obviously, we have to diversify. We already mentioned this, Korea EU, Korea US, Korea India. We did that uh, to avoid, you know, one uh, excessively uh, relying on one, one country. Still, we are depending on China too much, but we are, we are doing this by diversifying our relations with uh, other parts of the world. And the second question about the trade liberalization is always good. Uh, I was mentioning about FTA, but you are, you are right. For even Korea had a huge protection at the early stage of economic development. But remember, we have a, in the textbook, we have a so-called infant industry argument. You are infant, so you need protection. But sometimes, some industries in some certain countries, 100 years old infant exists. In other words, you, you continue to protect, continue to protect. So trade liberalization means, especially according to WTO, even FTA, is a gradual liberalization over a 10-year period. But if you are very much you know, weak uh, in terms of uh, your competitiveness, you can exclude this sector uh, to protect them. But what I'm saying is here, if you want to continue to protect forever, you never actually grow into the next stage of industrial development. So we have to keep that in mind. I will, I will stop here. I think one important lesson from the Korean example, uh, which goes to the question we heard before about protectionism, is that the industrial policy of Korea and Japan of the 50s and the 60s and 70s won't work today. It doesn't work for India. It doesn't work for Turkey because the world looks different. The interdependencies between the economies are different. And even if you have a vast economy, domestic market like India, it simply doesn't work because of how the economies are geared and because of how the global competition looks. And as successful as Korea has been, um, there are a couple of things in its industrial models that needs to reinvention. We talked about creative industry before. Korea has been very good at 
gaming the existing value chain that has been established by US and EU and Japan and to a certain extent China, but it has not yet been able to disrupt it. It has not produced a Google, it has not produced an Ikea, and it has, it can produce Gangnam Style, but it cannot produce Issey Miyake, just to take a, another horrible example. So in that sense, in terms of disrupting the current business model, and especially from, from the consumer perspective, from the demand side, it has not yet happened. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Jump here as well, and then Jan. So I think coming back to the point about liberalization of trade, whether it's a good idea, bad idea, I agree with Theo who said. But fundamentally, I think the point that needs to be stressed is that the, a society that succeeds is one that's open. Now, the openness must be managed in one form or another. In contrast, South Korea with North Korea, East Germany with West Germany. Um, when I was in uh, Korea in the 60s, the interest, the curiosity, people wanted to learn about the world. Now, as Theo said, they managed the process extremely successfully, and that's one of the reasons they were able to go above middle income trap. But India, in, you said India's not going to be able to do it. India is an example of a society that's not really been open. I'm very, very skeptical. I don't know if there's any Indians here about the Modi uh, succeeding in his uh, Make in India campaign because India is basically a closed country. It's a fascinating place, and they make very good films. South Korea makes very good films too, but I don't think that's really quite the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing. I mean, I think I want to just challenge, I think, this idea that it's only for an infant industry protection that these um, uh, reservations around trade liberalization hold good. Um, again, I insist upon us looking at this in the terms of political economy as to who benefits. This is not just about being open. It's about the terms on which you are open and the terms and conditions under which you wish to have trade. One of the big things under TTIP, for example, is this idea of it being a deregulatory agenda, because most of the tariffs are already got rid of, therefore you're now looking to get rid of the regulatory barriers. And this means that the US companies that wish to import into the European Union are currently banned from doing so, because so many of their products are seen to be toxic and harmful to public health genetically modified foods, hormone beef, endocrine disruptors in toys, you name it, and pesticides in grain. And this is absolutely right, that we should have a restriction on trade precisely in order to defend our public health, our environmental safety, our democratic rights. And that's why it goes beyond just infant industry protection. TTIP is predicted to cost one million jobs in the European Union and the US combined. That's a minimum figure, that's the official estimate. And of course for economists, this is good. The loss of jobs means more efficiency. Two million Mexican campesinos lost their jobs as a direct result of NAFTA. For economists, this is good because it's more efficiency. And that's why I think they used to say in the old days that war is too important to be left to the generals. Trade policy is too important to be left to the economists. Uh, before we carry on, you, you wanted to... Yes, I'd like to say a few words on, uh, very briefly, uh, dealing with social issues, combining with trade. Trade economists really respect social issues. But when we do trade policies, we want to do, uh, we want to protect the social issues uh, with a measure which least affect trade. We are not saying, you know, tra uh, social issues are not important. So I think we have to bear in mind that we are trying to do that, I mean, not ignoring these social uh, or, or development issues. And ISDI, in the case of Korea US FTA, it become a huge dispute in, in Korean society. So we add many protections, you know, the chorus FTA, if you want to use SDI, then you have to be, uh, you cannot touch upon social issues like labor issues and promoting uh, traditional uh, shops in the, in, the, you know, in the town and the labor environment issues, you cannot touch that. So you can introduce uh, ISDI uh, with a pure motivation, why you want to do that. And then uh, we add lots of protection. Then I think you can have a viable uh, SDI, uh, ISDI. And uh, Korea EU FTA, we try to do investment negotiation, but uh, EU says, Investment policy is the uh, sovereign policy for member countries. 
We cannot do it co collectively. Now EU has changed its position. So we already have a many, many different bilateral investment treaty. We already have it. So maybe we can have a much better, you know, more improved uh, with more protection on social uh, issues is very important. I'm, I'm sorry, but I want to say just one thing about the benefit of trade liberalization. If you go back to 2000, year 2000, I was teaching my students the market share of foreign cars in Korea, market share of foreign cars, 0.8%. 0.8% of the whole consumption of cars, only 8% is coming from outside. You know what, uh, today, 16%. Okay, we are importing a lot of you know, cars from Europe. What yeah. make uh, Hyundai different from, because of that? Hyundai used to export cars with a very solid structure. When they sell domestically, they have uh, more thinner you know, windows and uh, <laughs> very, very poor windshields. They are discriminating <laughs> against domestic people. Now they are really good in serving domestic uh, consumers because of the competition. So uh, we cannot say just for one thing, for uh, the good or bad of trade, trade policy, but uh, generally speaking, it can enhance. In the last session says that you know, market opening actually uh, increased the power of jebels. Yeah. Hyundai is a really big jebel, but now they are serving the domestic residents, the domestic consumers in a much more you know, qualified services. This is the benefit of trade liberalization.